thank you all for attending. We would uh, first like to welcome our newest member, uh, Ken Campbell, who's joining us. Ken, thank you for joining the commission. And so uh, what we'd like to do, uh, because we don't have a quorum, this will be um, a meeting of information at this point. So um, having said that, we would like to move our invited guests up on the agenda because we do have the representatives here from Citizens Supporting Agriculture and Woodbridge. We'd like to give them an opportunity to share with us um, some of their thoughts on agriculture in Woodbridge. We do have a uh, very large farming community. I'm thrilled that we have representation from the, uh, the agriculture and farming community here so we can hear uh, what you folks are doing and uh, your uh, value to economic development in our community. So, Will, if you want to take the seat up there and if you um, associates want to... Right, exactly. There's one mic and one camera up here, so we want to make sure that we get the input from we'll those who want to participate. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce uh, Will Conway, representing the group, and again, uh, Leland Torrance. Thank you. So I'll just start by uh, introducing myself, Leland will introduce himself, and then we'll get into what we're proposing here. Uh, so a little background on myself and my involvement in Woodbridge and agriculture. I graduated from Amity in 2010. I went on to study environmental studies at Skidmore College in upstate New York. Uh, while I was in college, that's when I was first exposed to agriculture. started working on farms as much as I could while I was taking classes. Um, worked for a full summer at Massaro here in Woodbridge while I was home. Uh, since graduating, I uh, have been in Arizona. I spent two years in Arizona doing coordinating sustainable agriculture efforts on the Navajo Nation. Um, Following that, I moved to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, I spent a year there. Oh, wow. Excuse me. I'm so sorry. They're watching you on TV. They're excited. <laughs> <laughs> really poor form. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, yeah, Martha's Vineyard, I was doing similar stuff, um, both farming and doing education for a nonprofit group out there. Um, this past fall, I moved back here, um, becoming a teacher. Um, but I also am trying to keep some skin in the agricultural game. Um, Leland and I are growing shiitake mushrooms on a commercial scale on his parents' property in Woodbridge. Um, so we're practicing agriculture here in Woodbridge now, and um, we're and trying to get this. Yeah, and I'm working at Koan Farms this summer, which is a small farm at the Darling House. CSA. CSA, yeah. Um, and also, just through my involvement in the community, have been recruited and now I'm involved in and working on starting a Woodbridge Agriculture Commission, which uh, Leland will get into. So, my name is Leland Torrance. Um, like Will said, I, I, I also have been involved in farming my whole life. Uh, we kind of started right when we graduated from high school. We went and worked on a CSA in Wisconsin, and that kind of got the ball rolling with us being interested in supporting local agriculture, being involved in it. Um, and since we kind of started to attempt this uh, shiitake mushroom uh, venture, we s saw the need for maybe having an agricultural commission in the town of Woodbridge. Um, so what we're proposing to do is to establish one and um, we're just going around to different commissions and talking to local farmers and seeing if we have the support to start one and um, what people think about it. And we're kind of just trying to explain what, why it would be beneficial and what we might be able to do. So you, get, you handed out the handouts? No. So we have some handouts for you guys. Um, we drafted an ordinance. Uh, and the purpose of what we'd like to do is uh, the commission shall make recommendations to the Board of Selectmen regarding the preservation, use, and conservation of farmland and agriculture within the town of Woodbridge with the goal of educating, raising awareness, and supporting Woodbridge agriculture. Um, it seems like the town of Woodbridge could definitely benefit from having an agricultural commission. Um, there's a lot of farms here. There's a ton of historically significant farms that I think could 
could use the help of an agriculture commission to make them uh, sus sustainable again, or maybe even profitable, um, which is tough for a lot of farms. And so if we could help with getting grants or, or getting volunteers or getting uh, schools in the community to, to be involved or possibly um, just possibly helping, uh, helping farms that are struggling that, you know, need the help. Um, and just so, so for a point of information, we are um, the obviously the Economic Development Commission, and we are here to just listen to your proposal. Commissions are formed by the selectmen. We have our representative, Correct. Richard Cardoza, here um, mm -hmm. as deputy for selectmen, who is our liaison to the selectmen. So you have a very good audience here um, with Beautiful. Mika as well. Um, do you have any data? If I can just back yeah. up to, my name is Leland Torrance. I'm uh, Leland's dad, and uh, uh known Will since he was, I don't even remember how young, but. <laughs> Um, one, of, uh, one of the main purposes of our being here is to give you guys information, but what we would really like is a letter of recommendation supporting the uh, uh, creation of an agriculture. And in, in terms of the value, I think that's what would be helpful uh, in terms of the EDC providing that um, possible support would be understanding the economic uh, value to the farming community. Um, again, we do not have a forum at this point, so we're not in a position to take action this evening, but we can certainly take the information and then uh, revisit this in an upcoming meeting. Well, so first, I'll, Will has also, there's a handout at the end that's a study from UConn on the economic impact in Connecticut of an agricultural commission, or what agriculture does for the economy in Connecticut. But first, I'll, uh, in the second handout, that a proposal for Agriculture Commission in Woodbridge, it says, what does an Agriculture Commission do? And that's an Agriculture Commission acts as an advocate for Woodbridge agriculture. It can provide information to farmers and to other town boards and commissions about the benefits of a balance between agriculture and other land uses. Identify grant sources for farmers in the town and identify innovative opportunities for agriculture. Can raise the profile of agriculture in the town, work to preserve farmland, and act as a mediator on farm related issues. And how it pertains to the economics of the town, I think Will has some. Sure. So if you go down on that uh, document that Leland was just referring to, a proposal, um, there's a bullet. For economics, Woodbridge has many farm-related businesses and the potential for many more. Um, ag has a $3.5 billion economic impact on Connecticut's economy, and it generates more than 23,000 jobs. Um, the next bullet down also pertains to your purpose, which is the economic interest of agriculture. So it costs Woodbridge less to preserve farmland than to allow it to be developed for residential use. Um, every dollar of tax revenue raised farmland only costs an average of 30 cents. Well, land and residential development costs an average of one dollar and nine cents. You have the the spreadsheet or financial model, those numbers, because the way it's presented is is that because when you're talking about land use, you're thinking about how is this going to be used for the next twenty years or thirty years long term. Are these did these numbers look at it over a long term or a snapshot in time? If it's a snapshot in time, then it's it's misleading. You need to have See how the cash how cash flows look over a much longer period of time. So we can get that information. Yeah, that. That. Yeah, and I think and that, that's, that's a good would point. Certainly well, be helpful to if, if, if I can chime in. A, a, a lot of this data has to do with being consistent with the conservation development plan for Woodbridge. So if we were to change our zoning plans and we would say yes, we would like high density and we would we want it change our the character of our neighborhood it would be a very different picture but given our current um, uh, you know um, economic development plan our last approved plan and the plan approved 15 years before this these statistics are based on that so there's a certain amount of, of, of um, what would I say uh, Keeping a character of a town as it is now, which we've said in our conservation development, we want to do. So, in, 
in answer to your question, uh, I think these studies basically assume the consistency of the conservation development. Okay, I just, look, I, um, in another, I spent the better part of half my working life developing financial models on Wall Street, and I just would like to see the numbers, because that's, that, you know, you torture the numbers, they talk. Sure. Just, just, just yeah. the basic data, you know, the amount yeah. of farms, the amount of economic impact that the farms have in our community, nothing, you know, overly complex, but just real what the impact is to Woodbridge, I think would be helpful for all of us to know. So, yeah. You know, you, you've got a number of farms, the amount of acreage that the farms have. Um, to your point about the POCD, that's certainly the document that the town uh, commissions work under right now. I understand zoning is looking at other things, but we're not, we have to look under, to your point, what the current POCD, that the model that we're working under and that has been approved. So, you know, that's what the, this commission and all commissions work under. So, um, we certainly want to look at today's information. Having just that basic information blossom, as well as the uh, you know input into you know the greater community, certainly you know the amount of uh, agriculture from Woodbridge and where does it go? You know the input right. to you know the, the greater New Haven region. You know, right. I know Mazzaro so, you know contributes to a lot of restaurants down in New Haven, for example. Sure. And right. so there's economic value to that. I don't know how you quantify that. But that would be a problem right. uh, and to you to do, and perhaps. You know, all this information, again, is something that you can bring back to us at a future meeting. Definitely. I think that, you know, that's, that, that sort of economic study of agriculture in Woodbridge doesn't quite exist yet. Um, looking at each individual farm mm -hmm. and calculating the impact that they have on the community economically, that, you know, that would be quite the undertaking, and that could be something that the Agricultural Commission could look at. Um, we have come filed an inventory of farms, which we, you know, we can bring that to you. Um, but it, it includes not only the you know, sort of active, active farms that are profitable businesses, but also um, people who are hanging fields, um, historic properties that, that used to be in, in agriculture that, and their owners are interested in bringing them back into agriculture. But they um, all do provide taxes to the community. So there is right. that um, current economic value, all those pieces of land. They are, you know, they're, they're creating some sort of revenue, but they're also mm -hmm. paying taxes, so there's value there as well. Okay. So as far as um, speaking to the economic benefits of agriculture, what we brought with us is um, in the page with a nursery on top. And this is from a study that UConn did, and it was released in 2015, and it was looking at the overall economic impacts of agriculture in the state. Uh, I just provided the results page and you know, 20 pages of methods and things like that to try and save you guys the boredom. But if we look at um, the results, and really the important data here is in bold. So the, the total impact of Connecticut's agriculture industry on the state economy was between 3.3 .3 and $4 billion. Um, if we go down to the next bullet, the estimated output impact translates into nearly $1,127 in sales per Connecticut resident. Every dollar in sales in the agricultural industry generates an additional $2 in the state economy. In addition, the Connecticut agricultural industry generates between 20,007 and 21,696 jobs statewide, contributing 759 to $899 million in wages. Um, so agriculture has a return on the dollar. I think that that's why the state is continuing to provide grants for agriculture, which is one of our main goals is agricultural commissions, municipal agricultural commissions have better standings with these state level um, agricultural departments and, and funders. So, you mentioned you're from Amity. Perhaps you know the students over there can help with some of this data collection. Right. I don't know what sort of um, you know. There's like 200 clubs over to Amity, so yeah, that's you know, that's, that's you know perhaps you know as a service project for the students. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's that big of an undertaking to, to capture some of this data that folks is interested in getting, which I think okay. again would be helpful to all of us in so the community. 
truly understands the economic value of our farming community. Um, you know, separate from a commission, I think there's potential real value in the work you're doing. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, once we're done with this discussion, hopefully you can stick around for a, another discussion we're going to have, which is on the sustainable Connecticut aspect and how agriculture ties into that part of the discussion. Do uh, you guys have any other comments? Or? No, I think yeah. Yeah, yes, I just want to make one comment is that what uh, makes me so happy about this is that we have basically four uh, young people from graduated from Amity who are in our community who have started this initiative uh, to get a commission. And the idea of the commission is we don't have all the answers, uh, and these guys certainly don't, uh, you know, have PhDs in economics. But what they're suggesting is they have a lot of friends. They have, there are a lot of people in the community who have graduated from higher high, high school who want to stay here in Woodbridge. And one of the things they're interested in doing is farming. And so I really think, you know, as the, you know, a business owner here since 78 and, and uh, you know, your, your kind of skills, all of your skills, uh, I think it's very important we support uh, what the young men and women, and there's one other man, one uh, woman uh, who's not here today. Um, but I think the idea of merely supporting the idea of the commission so they can start to get some of the answers that you're looking for. I think we, we should, this is the kind of thing that we, as people who have brought up our kids in Woodbridge, want to support. Um, so that's my only added comment. Thank you. Um, Thoughts from our commission here. You can, what's, um, what's your driver? In other words, uh, obviously you have a passion for this. From your, you're asking to, to initiate a commission, and you're going in that specific direction. What's, where do you see what? What do you see is lacking um, currently that you feel that that'll fulfill? Well, with some of our conversations with local farmers, one of their biggest struggles is navigating the grant process. They know that they're out there as farmers. It's tough for them to find the time to do it. So agriculture commissions, and this is based off of discussions and research that. Um, other people in this small work group that we formed have done, agricultural commissions have really good standing with the state as far as receiving grant funding. Um, so we would act and write grants and direct funds towards local farms. Um, the other research that we've done and um, gap that we've perceived is the amount of people who have land that's historically been farmed who are looking to have it farmed again. So ways of recruiting farmers to Woodbridge. Um, the other is sort of, um, it's more anecdotal, but when Leland and I were starting this shiitake mushroom farm, we went and presented to wetlands um, because we we're conducting it in the wetlands at the Torrance's property. And um, we, you know, it, wetlands wasn't immediately receptive of the idea, um, but in fact, after doing some research, we found that there was a recent Connecticut Supreme Court case that stated that um, agriculture has priority over wetlands conservation. The wetlands has commission does not have any regulatory power over agriculture. Any agriculture that wants to be done in the wetlands can be done in the wetlands. That's Connecticut state legislation. So being that voice in the community to advocate for agriculture on potential land use issues, um, we also Seeing you there. Thank you. And the town as well, obviously, is a part of the farming community with the land right across the street here that the town owns and then leases to the farming community. So you know, it's certainly something you want to make sure you consider in your data collection is mm -hmm. town-owned land that's being leased back to the farming community. And you mentioned haying and things of that nature. There's a good amount of it. So. Yeah. Yeah, more than you think. Yeah. Now, have you been to the Conservation Commission yet? We did. I'm actually on the conservation oh, okay. commission. Um, they did present there. Okay. I was not able to be there that okay. night. Um, the um, we're we're not sure. We're going to go back there. Uh, we're not sure. Uh, we didn't sell ourselves very well in terms of why the importance of an ag commission 
as separate from a conservation commission because there are uh, combined commissions. Uh, we have done some research on that in terms of uh, the, the ability to get grant monies. Um, I can't speak for the Conservation Commission, but my personal opinion is that, and I am a member of the Working Lands Alliance in Connecticut and a founding member of the Land Trust in New Haven, um, is that it certainly appears that if you have an independent commission that's solely its sole uh, um, uh, job is to promote agriculture, it's much more effective than a combined commission. Uh, I will say the other thing is that the, right now, in one of the funds, there's quite a bit of money for um, uh, repurposing fallow farmland, farmland that hasn't been farmed for a number of years, and that's actually one of the um, uh, uh, certain areas that we would want a commission to go after because there are there are quite a bit of funds sitting there. Uh, that being said, um, Governor Malloy, when he uh, came to speak at the Working Lands Alliance annual meeting, uh, got a standing ovation, and uh, he looked at everybody and he said, well, this is the only room I can walk into and get a standing <laughs> ovation. And uh, But part of it is, and, and this is, I think, very important to Woodbridge and to the Economic Development uh, commission is that we need to be very uh, wary of trying to uh, educate whoever our next governor is going to be, uh, because right now much of that funding is there and dollars are available and and available to Woodbridge. So again, part of the data collection be really interesting to know how much of that land is in Woodbridge that's not being farmed that could be farmed and what the economic value of that land would be to our community if it was turned into active farmland. You know, there's the taxable side, but then there's the revenue side of if that land's just sitting there stagnant, it's Absolutely. not doing anything. But if we can start farming that land, there's additional value. And what is that additional value to our community? And I think this is the job of the commission. You know, this is what they should do. Uh, I think these young men have spent a lot of hours uh, and, and uh, the group, and I think in order, you know, to write a letter of support to say let's get a commission in place and let's let's get them doing the study but let's let's put the studies together again it's only an advisory commission this is this is you know so you're basically saying okay if we can get a, a bunch of people you know uh in one by uh woodbridge that are going to do the work and find out this data that you want i think that's the next step <clears throat> Well, again, we're not in a position where we can do that tonight because we don't have the quorum. But you know, we are definitely, hopefully, providing some questions that if, if some of these things you know can be answered uh, and addressed. You know, again, we're not looking for a full research project, but you know, some of these basic questions could certainly help because I've always been interested in the economic value of the farming community, um, the farming community to our larger community here in Woodbridge, sure. and, and I think just some basic numbers would certainly be helpful for everybody. Um, going forward. Did anybody else on the commission have any questions for our guests? No. Thank you for doing what you're doing yes. and taking the initiative. It's as Mr. Torrance says, I think it's a wonderful thing to see you folks do you know passionate enough to proceed with this and move forward. Thank so you thank so you. Much. Yeah, yeah thank we'll, you guys for your feedback. So what should next steps be? As well, as far say, as well we'll continue to stay in touch because okay. you know we'll have to invite you back because the fact that we don't have enough folks on our yeah. commission here. We can't make a recommendation, and wouldn't it be fair for us to, you know, ask them without your input? So okay. you know, I think certainly scheduling you to come back to another <clears throat> meeting in the very near future um, would be you know, next steps that we would take, and you know, potentially during that period of time, if you could do more data collection, that would be helpful. Sure. I just want to point out that um, one one thing that um, you got to think about is to know your audience, because um, we've been trying to tackle the issue of, um, of uh, how high the property tax burdens are here on people in town. And um, related to that, trying to fix that problem, is that uh, we don't really have very much of um, a, um, anything other than residential property taxes funding in town. And we're trying to diversify our sources of revenue. Farming could be one of them. Um, or trying to bring in industrial development that um, 
um, that might be within the character of the town, but still might be able to make a more significant contribution to the non-residential part of our tax, our cash flows. And um, that should be in the backs of your mind when you're thinking about mm -hmm. the, you know, presenting something to us because the land that, the unused land that we have in this town can be used for different purposes. And there's an opportunity cost to, um, if we allocate it to one thing versus another thing, we have to be certain that we're, we're um, making the best decision with respect to, you know, the opportunity cost of the land. Um, if we devote it to uh, industrial, it's something, then there's an opportunity cost to not say to farming and vice versa. And we just need to have a good sense of the best way to go because one of the big problems we're trying to get our hands around is, um, you know, the high burden of the property tax. Not to mention the country. Yeah. <laughs> well, and again, I don't mean to keep harping on this, but this is really why we feel, I mean, these guys have done this work just to try and form an advisory group. And, and the idea is that once we get that advisory group, we can start, we can get that group to get the, look for the answers you guys are getting uh, or asking for. Um, so I think that we're really not asking for much from this group, and we, we understand we need to come back. We're just asking for you guys to recognize that um, there are a group of people that are in, interested in a particular angle that may be a great opportunity cost, and it may be a, a win-win situation for a community, but without forming the commission and actually getting them at the table, giving their advice to the selectmen, we're, we, we can't really go any further. Any other questions? Is there a reason why you can't do it privately as instead of forming a commission? Why can't you just, you know, and farmers say, this is what our idea is, and then you know, bring the recommendation well, to the... That's a great point. Leland, go ahead. I, I think we can, and we sort of have, and we've been reaching out to pretty much all the farms in Woodbridge, but um, I, we kind of have had some backlash and people, like, not appreciating that. Um, they, they, they don't want us meeting privately. Right. If you look at the membership portion of our ordinance, I mean, these people would be appointed by the Board of Selectmen, which is, in theory, more democratic um, than private groups meeting together, which which, in, as far as membership goes, um, it can't be open to everyone. Um, and that gets complicated. I also, I've asked myself the same question. I've worked for 501c3 nonprofit groups that do the exact same thing mm -hmm. that the Agric Agricultural Commission is seeking to do. And the idea is the standing that you have with the state as an agriculture commission. Um, forming an agriculture commission is one of the big recommendations coming out of this brochure from the American Farmland Trust. Um, an agricultural commission it wasn't something I was familiar with until I came to Woodbridge and figured out that there was a, some some whispers of starting one um, and, and decided to get behind it because I thought, you know, why not just start a 501c3? But I think it's that it's your standing with, with funders and, and in getting grants. I would just say that um, getting your arms around how many, how many potential acres of farmland are we talking about here? And then um, Taking a look at um, examples of, you know, how much revenue per acre you can produce in in those um, in that kind of situation, and trying to do a bottoms up estimate how much how much revenue do you think we can get out of this, and um, try to use um, sample data from farms what their revenue per acre is and what their costs of production are. And back into kind of like a big model of um, you know what the cash flows look like. Because is it a bread is it a bread box or is it a barn that we're talking? About? If, it's a, if it's a bread box, then we might be wasting our time. You know, and I, the value of the crop. You know, yeah, the various right. crops. And then I was also thinking about I don't know if you've tapped into the folks that are doing the vertical um, farming in Connecticut right now. 
Um, there's some folks up in the Middletown area that are doing indoor vertical farming. Yeah, so, I've seen that, sir. I yeah. read something about that. You know, again, you know, there, there's other ways to continue to grow this as well. Right, so. you could throw that into the mix, mm -hmm. too, if you right. want to talk about it. There might be some unused land in a, in a zoned industrial that you might be able to do Exactly. Mm -hmm. And there is that sort of land in town. And again, you know, looking at potential opportunities, just things to think about as you're doing your research. No, we appreciate And tapping that. into that, those uh, folks that are starting that initiative in Connecticut. It, it sounds really interesting uh, from what I've, I've heard with this vertical farming stuff. Like, you grow a lot more stuff when you're growing vertical. People don't think about that. But you know, it's another creative way to farm and a way to expand your mission as well. So, any other comments, questions? One of the things that I would suggest, um, formal or not, uh, something that the EDC would like to and was, would be able to help you with is simply to support the agriculture activity that is going on. Because it is an economic driver in Woodbridge, and it is an industry that we care about. So, I mean, in terms of activities that we can help support you with, we'd be interested in talking more about that as well. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for coming. Thank you. Are you having your sustainable discussion next? Well, I was just going to defer to Courtney because sure. we're going to turn it over to our uh, updates from CERC of Courtney and Sadie. Um, we do have some items listed there. The Sustainable Connecticut is something that's part of this discussion. So these are some talking points, but perhaps we can start off with the Sustainable Connecticut part of the discussion, which very happy to know that CERC and our, our support from CERC um, is already involved in this. Connecticut is sure. one of the first 27 towns to sign up for Sustainable Connecticut. So we are actively uh, part of this, but we're in the infancy stage. I um, have one sheet here which talks about developing an agricultural friendly practices. This, um, and I'll let Courtney go over the details on it and how it works, but is a point-based system and we get points for everything that we do. So agriculture-wise, again, perhaps this is something uh, you folks want to take a look at so you could start seeing what are we doing and how you know this can support the sustainable part of Connecticut and what we're already doing in Woodbridge. And again, the more value you bring to the community, I think the more support you can potentially get in your mission. Um, and then we're going to talk about the EDC part of it and how we can potentially get points on the economic development side, again, to support this. So I'll, I'll let Courtney take over and, and talk sure. in more detail. For those detail. of you who don't know about Sustainable CT, it's a voluntary program for municipalities to simply say, we would like to be certified as a sustainable community. And you can find points in a number of different, nine different themes inclusive and equitable community impact, well-stewarded land and natural resources, efficient physical infrastructure and operations, vibrant and creative cultural ecosystems, dynamic and resilient planning, clean and diverse transportation systems and choices, strategic and inclusive public services, thriving local economies, and healthy, efficient, and diverse housing. And within those, there's a lot of points that you can be getting in different activities that you can do as a municipality. So um, Woodbridge is proud to be one of the first 26 uh, registered to say we are going to go after certification. And at a bronze level certification, you're looking at totaling 200 points, and each of them have a variety of points associated with each activity. And at a, at a silver level, you'd be looking at getting 400 points. So what we're now is registered and what Woodridge will now be working on over the first year in order to get certified will be looking at each of those activities and saying we're either already doing it or we would like to start doing that. And by so doing those things would add up all the points essentially and then apply for the level of certification. So I think it goes hand in hand with a lot of the things that we're hearing from you all tonight. And we would be very interested in you and others who can raise their hand and say, we're already doing this or that, and or we would like to start doing this or that. And Mika, you'll probably have from the selectman's perspective, I'm guessing, um, or the first selectman's office maybe, will be kind of the coordinator of all of the points from all the different volunteers and staff that will be, you know, voicing what we're doing here in Woodbridge for this. So, will be my guess. 
And so I'm actually just going to give this document to our guests here because this talks about the agricultural friendly practices themselves. So in the middle, you'll we'll see there, this details exactly how we go about getting those specific points. So if that document's much more useful, probably in your hands there. So if anyone is following along at home, this is a whole um, program based off of other successful states and most notably New Jersey, Sustainable Jersey has done a very good job with this and most of its towns are certified at this point, believe it or not. And if you would like to go to the Sustainable CT website to learn more, it's a very well done, uh, sustainablect.org. It's a very well done website and it has a lot more information. And so why are we doing all this? To the same point you brought up earlier, grant funding. So the more that we can show we're doing these things, the more opportunity that our community has to apply for various grants. Um, so it's an important in the work that everybody does help us um, collectively as a community. Any other uh, thoughts or comments from our commission on the sustainable Connecticut questions? Uh, so I'll continue to uh, turn the discussion over uh, Courtney, but I just wanted to uh, welcome, I, I forgot to acknowledge our friend in the back there. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, Bettina. That's right. Yes. Uh, Courtney? Sure. So, thank you, Jamie. Um, I wanted to start by, for those of you who I haven't met yet, Ken and Brooks, nice to meet you. And just so you're up to speed, um, the First Selectman's Office has retained CERC as economic development support for the community and specifically for the EDC. You probably were following along some of that. Um, but nice to meet you both in person. And last meeting was our first meeting. So um, I did attend the zoning regulations public information meeting this past week. Mika, I know you were there as well. And I would just wanted to give a, a brief update on what was going on. Um, the chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission started by introducing Leslie Cran, who is a consultant that had been working on some regulation updates over the past, my understanding was about a year. And um, her charge was somewhat broad. It was somewhat to modernize and bring the code, the regulation, zoning regulation in full up to a more modern look and feel. Um, I think there was just over time, as this is very common in many towns, as you add and amend zoning regulations, it gets a little bit confusing with different appendices and that kind of thing. So I think part of the charge was to just simply clean it up and modernize it. And there was another charge that had a little bit more to do with economic development, specifically in what she was calling the downtown area. That was somewhat debated um, during the public input session itself, but that was the, simply the charge that she was laying out. So she gave a brief presentation, and it was mostly around form and function as to what might make sense in that kind of area, that downtown kind of area. And the rest of the session was simply public input. They, people were able to come up to the microphones and express their opinions. Most of it was negative. It, during the time frame that I was there, I was not there for the whole thing, but I was there for a good hour or so, and there was quite a bit of unrest. People's concerns mostly revolved around traffic and noise, and um, some felt like that part of town was specifically targeted over and over for sort of additional development, which was kind of the crux of the piece that Leslie was presenting. We have had Leslie um, make her presentation here okay. in the past, but there has been changes to it, so I've suggested that perhaps we bring her back, depending on the timing of things on TP and Z, perhaps if not too late after attend our April meeting, perhaps to bring this commission up this Okay. Um, the sort of second part of the story is that the Planning and Zoning Commission did meet on Monday night. My understanding is I was not at that meeting, but I think where they came from was as they were digesting all of the public input, they decided most likely that they are going to carve out the non-controversial pieces of the recommendations for updating the zoning regulation and handle those in the near future and put on hold 
those that did were deemed controversial at that public input session. Um, Mika, if you have any understanding that's different than that, please share. No, when you, when you say negative, it was the folks down down the folks who did who were present, as you indicated, um, did not agree with everything that was presented in the way that it was presented, and and the other item that was uh, that I heard voiced over and over. What related to just the uh, burden on the town in terms of um, on our school systems and things of that nature with the additional development the way that it was the way that it was presented um, so obviously what the TPZ is is they took it they listened and then the meeting on Monday which I wasn't able to make and uh, was where they they discussed it and came up with what what Courtney just outlined and I encourage our, our newer folks if you haven't read the POCD the, the Plan of Conservation Development. I know TPNZ has referred to this document. Part of this document also has the Yale Urban Design Workshop recommendations, which came out of work that the EDC had done several years ago. So there's a lot of really good information. I know TPNZ's looked at it, and there's also some very good information that we'll review during our brainstorming session that comes out of the uh, Plan of Conservation Development as well, which is relevant um, to the work that we're doing here. Um, I did. Um, check with our legal counsel to see what role EDC has in this process. You know, we do want to support economic development. Uh, we are all residents of the community. And so, you know, the, the commission can support yay or nay. We can um, make recommendations to our feelings and then individually we can comment as well uh, on the matters of PPNZ because it is obviously something that's really important for our entire community. And I would always encourage you, as you're hearing from business, the business community, um, and you're serving as ambassadors between or liaison between the business community and the town government, that you make sure that you're bringing and making sure those concerns and that feedback is heard. Any other comments on that? Anybody watched it? It is on TV. They are um, replaying it. Uh, it's online as well, so um, you can get snippets of the, uh, the events that occurred last week during that public meeting at this point. <clears throat> again, I don't know what their, their uh, firm next steps are or when the next meeting might be, but again, if the timing works out, I think it would be helpful for this group to get an update from Leslie as well as to the potential changes that um, have occurred since she was last year. Um, if there's no other comments on the zoning side, we'll move on to the... <coughs> Excuse me. Is that a? Is, we do that now, or we have to wait again? Excuse me. Done during public comment. There is there is a, a point where there will be public okay, comment. Okay. So, so we, yes, yeah. by all means, you could at that moment at that point. Time so we that. do have to wait till the end till we get. The, oh, sorry. <coughs> the, last thing, uh -huh. the, the last thing I'll say is that it it was a, a, vol, a volatile session, if you will, but it was uh, in, in some ways you can look at it. There were over a hundred people who attended. So people are feeling very strongly about it, and that's uh, from a process standpoint. I think it's very encouraging, very uh, you know, to see that kind of an, uh, see that kind of a, <coughs> a showing in terms of something along this line. And we'll obviously continue to monitor that. So, excuse me. Um, the next item uh, under the inputs is the um, the traffic projects. Um, again, this organization through EDC has been uh, actively involved in the traffic. Um, improvements on Litchfield Turnpike as well as um, the uh, Route 15 exit 59 interchange. I've been a liaison since 2010 uh, on the traffic, uh, various traffic commissions. Studying this, there um, out of that has been uh, some short term projects that uh, will help improve traffic starting this spring of 18. Uh, along Litchfield Turnpike, and uh, Courtney, again, can uh, give us a little bit more of an update on that. And if anybody's interested, the information is definitely online that shows what work will be commencing this spring. Thanks, Jamie. Um, and what I know at this point is that DOT has received a low bidder, and they are awarding the contract by the end of this month. And the expected start date of that short-term safety project will be May 1st, is their hope. We are waiting on a schedule from DOT, and when we have that, we would um, like to make sure that we're sharing that information as widely as possible with the residents and businesses in Woodbridge. Um, and Jamie and I had talked a little bit this week about how, again, the EDC could be involved, and really the main crux of, of the involvement, I think, as appropriate would be to make sure 
that the business community is informed about the work and the impacts that it will have. So we could be looking at press release, we could be looking at social media through you know, visits with businesses, um, maybe doing an event around it even. So I think this would be a good um, group to really take the lead on making sure that our business community is informed about that. Great. And folks that are interested may be watching or here on the town website under the government link in the upper left-hand side, there is a, a direct link to Exit 59 information. And from there, there are links that um, provide the updates <coughs> throughout the process and shows the exact work that the uh, state will be commencing this spring. Any comments from the commission? Uh, I'm definitely encouraged that this will help address short-term traffic needs, basically starting from Lucy, and this is a joint Woodbridge-New Haven project. Um, it's funded uh, by the state, but it starts um, by Lucy Street and commences down uh, basically in New Haven at the intersection of Route 69 and 60. Uh, the final part of our discussion here with um, CERC is the brainstorming session. Courtney passed out um, a document earlier, which has the list which we started working on last meeting. I have to find my copy here. Uh, Woodbridge EDC Priority Spring 18. This thank, is thank you, sir. Sure, thank you for well, coming. Sun's been so plowing all night, so we have a little <laughs> weird. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Short term within next two months, mid term within six months, long term within 18 months. So again, these are things that we started talking about the last meeting Courtney's put together for us. Um, I mentioned the POCD, and uh, again, I encourage us to use that as a document because the POCD has input from not just EDC, but from the entire community, from the Charettes, from surveys. And part of that document has the economic development goals, which are laid out a little bit differently. Ongoing short term, which is outwards of three years, midterm is outwards of six years, and long term goes out to 10 years. But um, there are things that focus on building the uh, high value added commercial base, maintaining contact with the business community. So we're going to take and make sure that these are, are certainly incorporated into our priority list as well. Some of the things that we've worked on as well, I won't go through it all right now, but um, something that we should continue to use as a document because we do have the support of the community um, that help create the document. So you want to go through this list? Sure. Um, this is simply a brainstorming that we <coughs> held together with the EDC last month at this meeting. And really, we just put them in what we think are sort of the most obvious buckets of short, medium, and long term. We did um, have a follow-up meeting with First Selectman staff and Jamie just the other day, and where you see a little asterisk, that is really what we thought would probably sort of rise to the top as high priorities for this group to be doing. Um, formalizing a business visitation program where you all could be serving in some capacity as ambassadors, whether you're sort of splitting it up by industry or by geography of the town, where you could be making some of those visits alongside us and alongside the First Selectman's team. Um, also that we want to be sure that once we are doing those visits regularly and in addition to having the businesses come here regularly, which they will continue to do, I imagine um, that we're capturing that feedback in some kind of a formal manner so that we can take action and really understand meaningfully what has been done in response. And so that's where we're hoping that we can have your support. <coughs> support. This commission has spent many meetings struggling with that. Mika was on the the uh, commission at that time trying to formalize that. So I'm really hoping you guys can basically show us, okay, this is how other towns are successfully doing it. This is sort of the framework, and then we can run with that. And the second part of that, again, is I think really important is that feedback aspect of it so that we do have a formalized process to bring that feedback back to the commission, ultimately back to the selectmen. So uh, everybody's hearing that, that we're, we're asking the same questions and we're, we're getting uh, – you know, more uh, consistency in the uh, the feedback, and then we can uh, take and analyze that there. We're happy to provide that guy. And what you, in, along the lines of what you started to say, it's just uh, once you have it, what you do with it, where you go with it, and, and actually making it productive in terms, of, uh, in terms of something coming out of it as a result of what they say. Otherwise, why? And the, and the business community is so receptive to this. I mean, I've been mm -hmm. doing it for a couple of years. 
it's, it's like we said, you know, we're here from the government and we're here to help, and we really are. You know, we, we are, you know, representatives of our town government. Uh, the community, the business community that I met with has been very, very receptive to this, and I know Mika's out doing the same thing. Uh, and I, I just, it's a, sort of a fun activity to go out and visit our business neighbors. You know, we all, you know, shop and dine, out, you know, and, and visit our business community. So it doesn't take that much more to, to ask them a couple of questions while, they're, while we are there. And from my experience, they're very receptive to that. Yes. And my understanding is that there's over 800 businesses in town, including a lot of home-based businesses and young, you know, younger entrepreneur type businesses. So. We want to be sure we're addressing different industry sectors in different ways. Generally, what I find in terms of using the feedback meaningfully is that some of it is going to be one-offs where someone has an issue that is easy to put them in touch with a town employee that can help them and solve the issue right then and there. Others, it's over time trending information that you want to be sure you're bringing up to the Board of Selectmen and even farther up to you know state and federal legislative delegations who can advocate and even create policy in a, in a positive way for the business. Um, others that we thought would probably be high priority items, hosting a business breakfast, and that's actually open to, certainly doesn't have to be breakfast, but sort of hosting a business event. And we talked a little bit with, again, the first selectmen's team who've done traditionally a after hours, I believe and whether we maybe combine that and or sort of co-sponsor well, something. We, we've done both, and yeah, the both. after okay. hours have been more successful, and I okay. think that's where perhaps our efforts focus. Mm -hmm. Again, that, you know, my um, observation of the events we've had, I and mean, we've had some really good speakers at our breakfast, but not always as well attended, and it just seems the timing of the after hours events, the feedback's good, it's a little bit more informal, it's the end of the day, people you know, are, are willing to stick around for a couple more minutes rather than having to rush off to the office. Um, but I do understand that the first selected office is uh, going to be the primary coordinator, certainly wanting and willing to do those events. And the business community, in my experience, has benefited <coughs> both from the networking with each other, with senior leaders in Woodbridge. That's really what they're looking for is face time with you all and Board of Selectmen and other commissioners and certainly could benefit from experts if we have them as speakers or panelists. And then the third one that's starred here is what we were just talking about, ensuring that the traffic issues are advertised well to the business community once that construction begins, and actually even beforehand, just making sure that they understand this part of the project is really going to have zero impact on you, and then this next part is going to last from X to Y time frame, and it's going to have a real big impact. But we want to be sure that we're helping you promote that, you know, business is still open or, you know, whatever those issues are that we want to be sure we're in front of and really feeling that they feel that we're supporting them. And we'd be, ha I'd be happy to entertain any other questions or comments about this. Again, this is really just from a brainstorm that we had here. Just on that traffic, we'll, we'll move on. I mean, there will be some challenges or to improve things. There will be challenges. And to your point, you know, we have to make sure, you know, people are aware of those challenges. You know, with adding a, an additional lane basically in front of the Starbucks um, intersection or area, you know, that will present some construction delays and challenges. And um, we talked about the email that the town has, making sure that we're using that effectively communicating via our email list. And as we go around, we continue to collect that data and make sure that our business community is as happy as possible. But you know, working with our, our folks from the media that are here, and thank you for being here. You know, continue to use our media source to get this information out there that, um, you know, this project ultimately will help improve traffic flow uh, for not only our business community, but for all of our residents that are challenged by morning and afternoon rush hour around exit 59. There are additional items on the list. Um, one of them being the wayfinding. I chaired the wayfinding task force. I know one of the challenges there is, uh, quite frankly, and we've discussed this here before, is if you look at doing everything, there's a quite hefty price tag there, but uh, we really want to look at breaking that down and saying, what can we do? The wayfinding is, again, something that came out of the POCD, um, came out of steep funding, so we have a plan in place, but we want to make sure that that plan is implemented and that um, we can 
can do it in stages. And if we have to continue to, to help break that down into the smaller and smaller increments, you know, we do what we need to do to, um, to help move that process along. We want to end, Jamie. I, I, it's, it'd be um, wonderful to see if there's any means by which we can move that up in, in the sense of priority as far as fund, as far as raising funds or identifying funds to grants and things of that nature. I don't know if anybody's working with Sheila at this point in time on anything along those lines. Well, that's part of I think what we're now doing here because the mm -hmm. wayfinding task force basically wrapped up its work, so that's right. no longer in existence. So I think it's sort of going back under EDC, so that's why maybe we can put an asterisk next to that. And it, it seems you know. as if that one should be more of a priority. It's a, something tangible, and it's certainly mm -hmm. from the, for the entire time that I've lived in town, you go down to the, the business district there, it's something that if you talk to any of those business owners, that's one of the first things they'll always mention. So there's two things. One is the um, potential grant funding, which hopefully CERC can help us with. But the second is, and this is something we talked a lot about during our wayfinding task force, is how the business community can potentially help fund mm -hmm. this. And if you can help us understand what sort of methods there are <coughs> for sponsorships, and we talked a lot about that because some of the signs were designed um, where you can put sponsorship on them. Uh, we see that very commonly when you're exiting any of the parkway ramps in the area. You know, welcome to X community sponsored by this organization or that organization. You know, subtle ways, but maybe there are other opportunities out there that we're not aware of that we can discuss here um, at our meetings. And, and again, as we're out visiting and being ambassadors and people, that's they complain about traffic and they complain about signage. That's a right. very common theme. Well, we're addressing the traffic issue right now, and so if we can, you know, have a more firm solution on the signage, that would be great. And you know, enough people complain, say, okay, well, you know, we can, you know, do X to solve this. We just don't know what that is right now. Yeah, we'll thank be you, happy Brooks. To bring, we'll be happy to bring some models of what other towns are doing and sort of how to go about it. You know, I think that. Um, I mean, what I, I'd love to see is that um, new item maybe put in the midterm of actual a sign being approved, you know, within six months, you know, the, the first sign just getting being approved, started. rather than putting that long term, we've already done it, you know, how do we actually get that first sign, you know, installed? And, you know, we found locations, we have the plan, we just need the funding, so if we don't put it on the list to actually Put that sign up. Okay. And it's really within the business district because the steep grant funding was prioritizing the business district. We did identify sign locations throughout the entire community, but the the bulk of the funding was the focus on the business district. So we want to make sure the first sign or two is installed within okay. the business district, not from the perspective of EDC, but from the perspective of the funding okay. was specifically earmarked for that sure. purpose. That. And this can be a dynamic document that we, you know, change and reprioritize and add to and all that. Any other comments on the priority list? Well, um, Courtney or Sadie, do you have any other items for us at this point? I do not, do you think? Um, the only other thing that I'd recommend we put on for future discussion is, and uh, Jody was very good at this, and in the past we had it on our agenda, was um, various economic development forums, conferences, uh, webinars, events that we can attend. And you folks probably have a much better pipeline as to what those are, so in each month we would do one, if we had attended one, we'd provide an update, but maybe on the agenda, if we could just put, uh, I'm not sure how we, we state that on the agenda, but yeah. either past or upcoming events and notify our commissioners because we do have, if it, there is a small fee involved, we do have some budgetary money for our commissioners to attend those sort of events. But I know many of them are free too, and I know CERC puts events on, and I've yeah. attended some webinars. and So we just want right. to make sure our, our folks are aware of yeah, those we'll opportunities. Yeah, we provide that on a regular basis. Ken?
Any feedback, comments at this point? No, not at all. Just completely overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That's a lot. <laughs> Mika? No, I, um, I regret not suggesting we let Mr. Torrance say what he was going to say. I'm curious to know. He couldn't stay, and I didn't realize that that was going to be the case, but I feel badly about that. But, uh, hopefully he'll have a, another opportunity, certainly. Um, when we don't have any other public comment, um, does anybody else have any closing thoughts then? I mean, we've worked We'd our way. We'd be happy to reach out to him if that's helpful. If you hear what he's, he's going to say. That'd be great. And start Good. a conversation just in general mm -hmm. about, again, what I just mentioned at the very end of that discussion, just that regardless of whether we have a formal commission or not, I think we're interested in supporting all industry sectors in town. And Absolutely. if they're the pulse on how to do some supporting of the agricultural group, why not start a conversation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it is a, a, a large part, but I've never been able to figure out how to invite them because there are, it is fractured and it is great that they're looking to form something. So I, I think it, to, to Brooke's point, um, to not hold off on waiting for a formation of something, but some of this is some very valuable data that hopefully they can uh, bring to us sooner rather than later so we can help support that part of our business community. I mean, is there a business organization for these 800 businesses? Well, what we used to have was we used to have the Woodbridge Bethany Chamber of Commerce, which I was president of probably 15 plus years ago. And that was an independent group, but really didn't have any legs to it on its own. So when I had left, um, another person came in to run it. And then at the same time, the Greater New Haven Chamber came along and absorbed it up as a council, a business council. And things sort of went by the wayside because we didn't really have any more participation at that point, and the council sort of disappeared. Mm -hmm. What we have is we have um, the Valley Chamber, which Bill Purcell lives here in town, and Bill Purcell is very active in our various business after hours. So because we have had Bill Purcell in the Valley, which, you know, Woodbridge is, you know, bordering the Valley, and they have Greater New Haven, which is focused on the Greater New Haven region, but then they have, you know, their stretch up into the Greater Wallingford area. Um, we sort of don't have any formal organization um, focused specifically on the business community right now. But, you know, we work with, you know, sort of both chambers. I believe Bill's been in recently to meet with our first selectman's office. Uh, the new president of the Greater New Haven Chamber just started. And, uh, you know, we're encouraging the first selectman's office to meet with the new president of that chamber to see what goal the chambers may play. Um, press um, did host a business after hours for the Greater New Haven Chamber back in October. And I believe the JCC this spring is also hosting another event with the Chamber. Um, but that's part of the Greater New Haven Greater chamber, chamber, not a specific Woodbridge um, Chamber. Say, so, do you have any, I mean, uh, Courtney, do you have any comment on that? Um, just that. Really, the EDC is the group that you know supports all the business, especially because the chamber is a membership organization, and they do a great job with the members that they do have. But not, you know, you're not obligated to join it, even as a, even when you do have a local single chamber per town, which is rarer these days. But I think, you know, we're always encouraging the EDC to sort of wrap their arms around, to the extent that we can, wrap our arms around the entire business, help them feel supported and advocated for. And with the business after hours, it's uh, basically a free event. You don't have to be a member. Those, I think, have been, again, the most successful ones that we've had, where, you know, that one of our local, you know, dining establishments in town, we get 15, 20 business people showing up at it. Uh, they've, you know, offered up, you know, some appetizers as part of their support of the event. So it's, it, they've been very successful. And so we're hoping that we can ensure that we have all of those um, but it's been out of the first select office. So again, we'll work in coordination with sense. But we're always looking for new ideas. And we've tried the breakfast. Some have worked better than others. And you know, I'm certainly willing to, you know, try different things. We have the Fall Palooza event, which is something that sort of came out of uh, this commission along with a uh, prior commissioner that, um, you know, continues to try different events around Fall Palooza. Uh, which is basically taking all the different events through the month of October and putting them under one umbrella and having more town-wide support of the various events, um, some of which are business-related and some of which are related. My sense was that the breakfast
breakfast seemed to work pretty well for disseminating information. We were presenting information that was, was important to the business owners. And like, for example, this traffic, uh, this traffic project would be a, a great example. I think if you were to say we're having a breakfast meeting, we're going to discuss very specifically what's going on and what the next steps are, things of that nature. Um, but yeah, I, as he's turned out. Right, right. Whereas, um, like you said, the after hours was great more for collecting information just because of the dialogue. That's a and, you great know. idea. So, you know, that type of thing there. Yeah, because I think the most successful business um, breakfast events we had were around those specific issues, like when we had the signage one many right. years ago. It was very good turnout because everybody was concerned about signage. Right. And there was a lot of discussion. And knowing that this project will commence this spring in you know, roughly May or so. If we did our, you know, uh, I don't know, it's too late probably to do a, an April one, but maybe, you know, right around that period of time, maybe we can, you know, have a breakfast in May, specifically even around if, the traffic. after it started and there's some, you know, because then some, some implications, or right, right. There's right. Some implication as a result of it, to have something where people are going to go, I think it would be, um, you know, I think people will respond to it. Mm -hmm. And have the timeline so they all know right. what's going on and what the ultimate end goal is and the improvements that will be made. And, yeah, there's going to be a couple of short-term delays, but ultimately long-term it's going to help. And maybe we can even get you know, somebody from DOT to attend. Right. And Probably we would want DOT to be the headline speaker, in fact. Yeah. And we have relationships, and I'm sure the town does as well, with those project managers that would be able to speak to this the best. That would be great. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's, let's see if we can do that aim for that. try to do it in April. Try to do it ahead of it. I'm guessing. How long will the project take? Um, they said short term. Do you know their definition of short term? <laughs> I know. That could be years. <laughs> originally, it was 12 to 18 months. Uh, for, this, for this portion. This, of this, right. And so, and I say that because it was, you know, supposed to start in the spring. And there was, you know, best, can eight, best case, the bulk of it was going to be done by November, but you can't be doing road work after, you know, late November, early December. You can't do any more road work because you can't get the asphalt. So that brings us in the spring of 19 because they're not going to be doing anything over next winter. So that's why it's really that 12 to 18 months. And how informed is the community, business community now? This happening in two months. Did you know about it? Well, there you go. I mean, there's, a, there's certainly there's information out there, and there have been a number of different sessions that they've, they've but you know, not everybody attends. And so, generally speaking, I think we we had that email fair. list, the business email list, but again, that was only going to businesses in Woodbridge, not everybody. And so, uh, again, hopefully with our media outlet here, you know, we've got a source. The town puts their emails out. My understanding was, and Mika maybe you know more about this, that there were some challenges with the email system rate recently yep. because it was very consistently we were getting a lot of emails, and then all of a sudden they stopped. And I think for the town, I mean, they had, I don't know, 800 emails or something. So, Well, I'm concerned but, about the businesses themselves and how much they know. You know, the community will find out, hey, I can't go down this road. but Businesses need to prepare well mm -hmm. for you know, potential road closings or new entrances and signage for that and uh, specific signs for their own stores instead of all of a sudden and roads closed yeah. and he's uh, not a business today. I'm sure DOT has some required you know, public outreach that they have to do to the affected areas, but how effective that has been or has that even happened. I mean, I don't know, but we can certainly look into that mm -hmm. immediately. It seems to be some goodwill that right. this committee can share and shed on. Because to, that's a great to your point, point it's, it's also going to be just to what they think are the affected businesses. And I'm Every just business out is going to be affected. Exactly. <laughs> I'm just outside on of Which field turnpike is going right. to be affected. And all of us in the Bradley. industrial yeah. area, as we call it, you know, Woodbridge Corporate Park or whatever we are, we're all going to be affected and we're, nobody's going to know about it in there other than those that I've told that I've met with. So, right. you know, definitely, you know, I, again, if we can pull something off in, you know, April, I don't know, coordination-wise, but um, the JCC has been very open to and welcoming us for community uh, right. gatherings. So, we... Well, just as we were talking, I... Would um, <coughs> I would recommend that we at Cirque 
put together immediately a very short-term targeted sort of activity list that we can, you know, take, basically, uh, mm -hmm. pertaining to this issue. Although I am thinking, so. you know, as much as JCC has been willing to host us, there are other establishments in that area that probably can host 20, 30 people in the morning and would be happy to have that sort of audience there right in that area. Okay. Um, and we can talk offline, perhaps, about that. Sure. Possible to put together a uh, like a news brief, so to speak, that can be given to folks. So literally, so along the lines of what you're saying, it would be kind of frustrating as a business owner that if I wasn't aware of it. And, yeah, because and the information online is not that. The information right. online is the overall scope of, of the, the entire project, project, but not what they want. <laughs> they, they want to know when's it going to start, right. what's the impact, and when's it going to be done. Right. And that's not online, I can tell you that. But the state it certainly has there. I was thinking along the lines of what you're saying, short and sweet, you know, yeah. boom, this is, this is, and it could be, you know. And ultimately, how are things going to improve? Right. We'll work. Okay. Yeah. We'll stay in touch. You know, we do have our next meeting is the, the second Thursday of April, that's which would be 12th. the 12th. Yeah. Um, so we probably want to be working on this in the interim. You know, if if it was you know scheduled for like the week of you know the twenty third, maybe you know the end of April, you know that would be certainly before the project starts. Um, you know, so that gives us a little bit of time, especially if we had to. Again, I'm just talking out loud when we have the commission is here, but if we you know we're able to plan it and have everything you know planned by our meeting on the twelfth, then we have. Uh, you know, we can already start certainly promoting it, but then the commission is aware of it, and then you know we've got a week to prepare for if it was you know done the week of the twenty third or something. Right, and not to be overly ambitious with your resources. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of. Um, we'll do our best. What, 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 the other thing I'm thinking is it's a, a perfect opportunity from an outreach standpoint, along the lines of what you were saying, from an outreach standpoint in terms of going to these different businesses to specifically let them know that something like this is happening and, and what, what's going on. It really gives you reason to get out there and something to say to people, which makes some folks feel a little bit more comfortable. Right, so. and, and the right. great thing with the week of the um, that 23rd is then our next meeting is May 10th. So, you know, then, you know, we have, you know, it's sort of in between our meetings and sure. we have time to digest that information that we you know, received from that event. Again, I'm just talking out loud. We yeah, have to we'll coordinate do, with the we'll selectman's office. And, I think you know, the, office um, and the schedule, as soon as the selectman's office has the actual schedule, that will really inform. Mm -hmm. Because I think if they're saying we hope to start on May 1, it could be May 1, it could be June 1. And that can give us a little bit more sort of guidance around how we want to time this. Mm -hmm. So we will stay in close touch with that schedule. Is that actually going to be closed when they? No, this is just um, basically expanding to five lanes in front of Starbucks and addressing each of the intersections from Lucy on down to in front of Walgreens. So each of those intersections will be, you know, they're basically graded A through F. Most of them are D through Fs, and they're all going to be raised to a level C, which means there'll be improvements with every intersection. So, example, you're coming down Pond Lily. You've already seen some improvements down Pond Lily where they've painted some stuff in the road. And so basically, Pond Lily will be a right turn only. There will be no way to turn left because they're going to put a physical engineering um, structure in there by putting raised curving. So you, you would literally have to drive out to the middle of the road to turn right. Mm -hmm. But in their mind, with the traffic analysis coming down Pond Lily, with everybody only being able to turn right, that will help improve traffic as well. And increase the amount of time the light will stay green for the people who are turning to get down the Mirror Parkway. And right. then when you're coming, sa um, you're coming southbound down 69 in front of Starbucks, there will literally be five lanes now, three going southbound. The left hand of those will be used to go onto the parkway. There will be one through into New Haven because a lot of people want to go through and they can't because they're all stuck because there's only one lane. And it will actually be a T intersection rather than that curving um, on ramp, you'll have to come to a full T intersection, and there will be at that third lane in front of Starbucks or Katz's at that point, which will be used to turn right to get onto the parkway. And so it will actually be a wider road in there. So that's where the 
the bulk of the road work will be right in there and expanding that road and addressing traffic lights and all that sort of stuff and then working on down there will be some additional sidewalks that we put in along the left hand side um, of the New Haven of 60 step. I will not be at the next meeting. I don't know. I, I'll ask Sheila and or Beth if they, they would like to attend. Okay. Any other uh, comments? No. If not, uh, we will adjourn and uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you.